Hello again, friends. Welcome back to Case Studies. This week, we're gonna talk about Nintendo. Nintendo was one that you asked for, and I've been listening to you, and I think there's a very interesting case study to look at the birth of Nintendo forward and to learn two things. The first is, understand your core competencies and stick with them and refer to those core competencies when you're making important strategic decisions about your business. Point two, innovation is always about starting again. Product innovation means maybe not necessarily leaning on yesterday's products, but finding new ones. And we're gonna see how Nintendo was good at that and how along the way they also learned some hard lessons. Let's talk at the humble start of Nintendo. To go back to the start of Nintendo, you have to go back to 1889. Now don't worry, we're not gonna go all the way back there, but we're just gonna to refer to it for a moment. And it was Fusahiro Yamauchi who launched Nintendo back in 1889. Uh, it, in the word Nintendo, believe it or not, the brand Nintendo means Nintendo, which are the kanji characters or sounds, which literally mean leave luck to heaven. So Nintendo, as we go Nintendo, means leave luck to heaven in the original Japanese kanji. So here he is, 1889, and the government has just legalized playing cards. Can you believe that? Playing cards legalized in Japan in 1889. So he says, I got to sell them. So he took the wood from mulberry trees and was selling playing cards. He would run Nintendo successful, building a network of distribution, getting playing cards to every corner of Japan under the Nintendo brand name. And he would do that for about 40 years. So Nintendo's being passed to Hiroshi right here about 1977, a little before that actually. And he, the first thing he does is he fires every manager that was left over and appointed by his grandfather. Thanks, granddad, we're making some changes. He hired younger managers because he thought they needed to go beyond playing cards into a more innovative future. He says, no, wait a minute. What are our core competencies? And he said, you know, our core competencies, we know how to distribute things. We have relationships with an extensive pipeline of stores and distributors and sub-distributors. Um, it's a question of what will distribute through there because that is the strength of Nintendo, one of our core competencies. Playing cards wasn't a crazy innovation, but we knew how to get things everywhere. So he set about looking for a product category. And the one he found that really struck him was the birth of the very, very early video game industry. And he said, Nintendo's going in for video games and we're gonna use our distribution so that we can get those video games and all the shops that are gonna sell them. Because remember, playing cards in the legacies, he was dealing with toy stores, variety stores, and small stores that sold you know, minor bits of entertainment. Perfect, if he could get video games going, he could go to those same customers and move them through. That's a great lesson here about knowing your core competency, even though you might think playing cards and novelty to technology video games would be difficult. Well, if he pulls it off, he's got a place to sell it. So in 19, 1977, excuse me, they had this little shoebox signed orange console that was called, translated into English, the Color TV Game 6, which stood for something you could play on a color TV and it had six games in it that were all variations of tennis in one form or another. And later, oh, we doubled it, the TV 15, 15 games in 1977. So that's, that's what it was all about. And they ran that, they sold it, they sold one million units, and then they counted all their dollars, or excuse me, they counted their yen and they lost money. But they had learned something. People love games and were willing to pay games and they were able to sell them through their distribution. He then made a critical decision. He said, they love these things, but where is the biggest market in the world for video games? The United States. I need to get into the United States. So they looked at the game market and he said, you know, there's two parts to this game market. Part one is these little baby consoles that had shown up, like the ones they made, but there was also the full-size video game that would be in the arcade. Yep, the great big square box the size of a small refrigerator in which you would play things later, such as Pac-Man. Well, long before Pac-Man, here they come inventing their way into the large frame video game. And so he wanted to find somebody that could help him dive into the American market, specifically with these large-scale video games. And so 
he had a relative that was living in Vancouver, Canada. It happened to be a gentleman that was married to his daughter, Yoko. And his name was Arakawa. And he went to Arakawa and he said, you are just the man to open up Nintendo in the United States. You already live in North America, you live in Canada. And in 1980, Nintendo of America was founded. So, away we went. And this begins the, t the segment of the story, the case study, where it's really important to understand your core competencies. And if you don't have expertise somewhere, turn over every rock you can to go find somebody to help you, because it might already be done. It might already be an expertise someone has. Go find them and bring them into your company or at least consult with them. And that's what he did. He went out and he discovered a pair of guys named Al Stone and Ron Judy. They were University of Washington frat buddies that had been trying to be entrepreneurs and they had a trucking company. And they formed a distribution company called Far East Video for video games coming from the Far East. And they had used their assets to create a company and they had heard about Nintendo and they went to them and they say, let us distribute your full-size video games in America. And the first one they went out with was Space Fever. And it was kind of a ripoff of Space Invaders, which was the real hit one. But nonetheless, it did well. And back in those days, they had a phrase, the quarter magnet. That machine there, that game is a magnet for quarters. In other words, all the quarters come out of you and my pocket and we just play the game for hours. Well, the follow-ups were terrible. <clears throat> there were sequels to Space Fever and they just didn't work. And now, suddenly, Stone and Judy were almost ready to quit. And they're like, what do we do now? When Arakawa said, you know what? We're gonna find a mega hit. Trust me, we're gonna do it. And they brought a game over called Radar Scope. And they did some testing on Radar Scope. They did some evaluations of it and they thought it was gonna be good. So Stone and Judy went out and sold the pizza parlors, the restaurants and the arcade places and they got their game in there. And they showed up and the repeat play on Radar Scope was non-existent. People would play it once, said eh, and then didn't play it again. Suddenly, Nintendo of America is on the verge of death. And they had all these Radar Scope games in stock because they had gotten ready to move them over. And that's when Arakaro went inside the company and said, we gotta make a different game, we gotta figure this out. And so he identified Shigeru Miyamoto. And Shigeru Miyamoto is kind of this slightly long-haired, uh, real kind of a, what we would now call a gamer or a game designer. And he had a lot of ideas and he was a designer that they trusted. And Nintendo had tried to close a deal with King Features, a holding company of media assets, United States, and they were gonna bring Popeye the Sailor Man to a video game. And it was a game where Popeye, I don't know if you know Popeye, he had a girlfriend named Olive Oil, and he had to save Olive Oil and rescue her, because that's the way the cartoon worked with Popeye. He would eat spinach, get big muscles, and go beat up people and save his beloved girlfriend. So they were doing a video game where that would happen to Popeye, but he had to jump and hop over obstacles back and forth because his enemy, the bully named Bluto, was trying to kidnap Olive Oil. So if you're thinking that you're already hearing what game this is about, keep listening for a minute. Says, this forced Miyamoto to say, well, I guess I'll make this thing into Popeye. And it, it caused him to think about that framework and it was working for him when King Features called and said, we don't like the negotiation, we're pulling our contract, you can't use Popeye. Well now they're like, great, here we thought that this was gonna be the rescue for Nintendo and we got a bunch of video machines for this Popeye the Sailor Man, what do we do now? We don't have the rights to it. <clears throat> well, they didn't know what to do, but Shigeru Miyamoto said, you know what? Give me a second, I have some ideas. And so he went working in his lab designing the game and he says, we have to ship the software over to reprogram the video game, those big arcade video games we have and we're gonna have to paint something new on them and we'll have all the graphics, we'll have everything so we can do that. Trust me, I'm coming. So they come over there and he brings the first one to them and they plug it in with everybody watching and up on the screen comes the little logo. Donkey Kong. And here we have the birth of what would be a legend in arcade. They were worried about it. They said, this seems kind of silly. 
You know, who wants to play a game where this little red plumber guy has to go around rescuing things um, and go save the princess by bouncing around and jumping over things? But they're like, let's go with it. And guess what? There had never been a arcade game like Donkey Kong. It was the biggest quarter magnet, as they say, of all time. Then a Hollywood studio called and said, excuse me, you're violating our copyright on King Kong. Well, everyone was hearing about the amazing profits that Nintendo was making, and so Arakawa was worried that, he said, is this just Hollywood trying to shake me down and trying to take the profits out of this? Because they demanded all the profits from Donkey Kong, or they would sue them and keep suing them in court, and they would be tied up in court forever. Yeah, nice guys in Hollywood, right? You can tell this was when Hollywood had no clue about new, me new revenue sources for new media. They were still defending old copyrights and things except the Lincoln lawyer shows up. And I use that phrase for a reason. Howard Lincoln was a very nice and very uh, strong lawyer that Arakawa had used for a lot of the, like the deal he did with, uh, the, with Stone and Judy and some other things, and he trusted him. And he says, what do we do now? And so Howard Lincoln went to work. He did a bunch of research and he found out that Hollywood had forgotten to file a full copyright trademark on King Kong. So he went to court and fought. And in 1983, the court not only tossed out the case, they forced Hollywood, MCA, to pay over $1 million in legal fees that Nintendo had spent and a little bit of damages. And Nintendo had won victoriously and Donkey Kong would go. Well, also, about that time in the early 80s, there was a bubble in the video games market. What was happening was everybody and their brother was making video games, including a pet food company named Perina. I mean, what are they doing in the space? They don't have the core competencies to make video games. So, what happened in any hot market, in any bubble market? It popped. And there was a crash in the video game market right in the early 80s, where companies like Atari, went bankrupt and Sega was sold for pennies on the dollar in the you know, mid 80s there as this market just was crushed. And then a funny thing happened. Nintendo lived and it lived on Donkey Kong money because they kept going. And at that point, the console, which they had introduced in Japan not too many years prior, came to the United States. And it came to the United States in the form of the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. Right before NES came out, there was a thing called the Famicom console that Nintendo had introduced in Japan. And it did okay and everything, and they were Nintendo Japan really wanted Nintendo USA to bring it. And so, uh, eventually, they said, well, let's be patient, let's do a good rollout, and let's do this properly. And in 1984, it came to the Consumer Electronics Show, and it didn't get a lot of hype. As a matter of fact, there were people at the Consumer Electronics Show, which was a big, big trade show in America, where careers and futures could be made and broken in consumer electronics, from TVs to VCRs, back then VCRs, computers and things like that. It was a big deal. And in this little corner, there was video games that had really risen into something. And nonetheless, Nintendo Entertainment System was panned. But there was one guy that came up that they met. Remember the part about core competencies and work with people that maybe have skills you don't? The Lincoln lawyer, Stone and Judy, distributing games to pizza parlors. Good people had come and been part of the Nintendo success and pulled it back from the edge more than once. And Sam Borofsky, a marketing and sales representative running a basically a marketing consultancy in Manhattan says, I see the promise for this. And what was interesting is he had worked with Atari during Atari's heyday, and he knew if you did it right that the American consumer would go crazy for video games. So he had the experience and he said, let's do a launch of this because I really think there's something. And they would discover just a little while later that the video game industry may have had a bubble, but the bubble because the wrong people were making bad products. In reality, the American consumer and the love of video games was just getting warmed up. And the Nintendo Entertainment System went on sale 
uh, even as people like Sega and others were crashing. And when this thing was launched, it became one of the most popular consoles of all time. Over the life of the Nintendo Entertainment System, it would sell 61 million consoles. And what was interesting is when you added it up, in a few short years, there was one Nintendo console in every 30 American homes. So you take a little classroom, every classroom of kids in America, say 30 of them, at least one of those kids had a Nintendo Entertainment console. All across the United States, one out of 30, to go from almost dying to being saved by Donkey Kong to having w one console in every 30 American homes. There's only one word for that, and that is, damn! They made a comeback, and they defined an industry, and they set records that would be you know, still in place decades later as the, they really helped birth and grow the video game industry and were a leader among the many, many players that all had their contribution. So they sold, believe it or not, um, six million consoles were sold in just, just 1988, which was incredible. And about the same time, they took their talents to the handhold, handheld, excuse me, portable console, the Game Boy. And the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color would sell 118 million units. As every kid in America that had seen and played Super Mario on their Nintendo Entertainment System was like, I'm taking that show on the road, I want one. To... And suddenly they were showing up in schools and kids were using them. And as they said, it was in their backpack and they were loving it. And so that's the, that's the story of how <clears throat> they go from their birth to here. Now let's take a look at what happened now that they're in the game. They have 118 million handhelds. They got 61 million here. These green lines represent the consoles, the ones you would put in your, in your home, connect them to your color TV. So the Super Nintendo came out in 1990, sold 50 million units, so down. The Nintendo 64 would come out in 96, 31 million. Then the uh, GameCube would come out in 01 and sell 21 million. Look what was happening with the console sales. The console sales were going down, but there was also PlayStation and PlayStation 2 and eventually Xbox, Xbox 360 that were jumping into the market. So it had big competition. The Game Boy Advance would be the next handheld and look at the success it would have in 01. It would move 81 million units over its life, introduced in 01. And then in 04, they introduced the Game Boy DS, and the Game Boy DS would sell 154 million units over its life cycle. That's pretty amazing. You step forward, and I'll turn around a little bit here. If we get to 2006, the Wii comes out, and suddenly this trend comes back. Here's what happened. If you take a look at each of these consoles, they really were building on the past. But you remember the Wii, it came out with action and you had controllers that you could move around with. And there was the joke about the wrist straps would break and the controller would fly across the room and break something at mom's house. Well, it was new, it was different. So look what happened when they applied the innovation that was inside Nintendo. They made a serious comeback with it. Then, you know, the on that they were still driving handhelds and the 3DS comes out moves 65 million units to date and it was introduced in 2011 and just recently the new console which is a combination of both the switch came out and the switch I don't even have the numbers up here because remember there was a Wii U which you could carry around and it didn't do very well at all and so as you can see Nintendo, in its history, it connected along the way with people that could help it when it didn't have its core competencies, but it studied its core competencies for distribution, and that's how it lived, and then its core competencies for making games. Because if you remember, Nintendo was a company that made a lot of its own games and didn't have as many third-party games. In other words, games made by other studios to work on their device. Whereas the Sony PlayStation was like, hey man, Everybody on the planet, if you can make a game, we'll give you the development kit, go knock yourself out. And it was very successful. And of course, the PlayStation 2 became legendary as one of the top two consoles ever in the history of gaming anywhere at any time. So here's the two things. 
understand your core competencies and find friends when you need them. And when you develop new core competencies, write them. And remember, innovation is often not merely trying to build on the prior generation. Sometimes it's starting again with completely new features and functionality. All of that can apply to you, whether you're joining a company like Nintendo or you're starting something yourself. I thank you very much. I will see you next time. Please subscribe to Valuetainment, the best channel on the internet for content for entrepreneurs. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, and I hope I left you better than I found you.